Uh, it's almost February. So to me, that's exciting. Valentine's Day is around the corner. Uh, before that, Groundhog Day. And then, I don't know if you notice, if you're like me and you're into like more light than less, <laughs> Uh, once you get past Groundhog Day, it seems like each day you notice that it gets just a little bit longer. And with a little more light means spring is just getting a little bit closer every day. And the birds and the green and everything gets happy again. So that's where I'm at. Maybe that's a little bit too much sharing. So let's get back to Joshua, okay? If you're new, you're visiting this morning, welcome. We have this Bible journal in the back, this beautiful purple covered thing. It's on the table in the back. Uh, and I, I brought like 10 more copies. I don't want to take these back. So if you don't have one yet, if you'd like to give one to somebody else, awesome. You find blank pages in it. You can write, you can draw, you can do all sorts of things in here without wrecking the binding of your Bible. You can wreck this binding if you want, whatever. But please take one and use it and benefit from it. So those are in the back, okay? I uh, just wanted to mention that real quick. We are going to look back at Joshua chapter 1 again in the original testament, way back towards the front of your Bible. We spoke last week about how Joshua is graduating onto the next level of his leadership development experience with God and Moses and all these things that God has been leading him through and how he's been learning. We, we, we took some time last week to focus in a little bit because I'm not assuming you know who Joshua is. Who is this guy? Pops out of nowhere. Well, there's quite a history. In fact, as I mentioned last week, he's mentioned at least 27 times in, in the first five books of the Bible. There's a lot of background information we have to this character named Joshua when we come to Joshua chapter 1, as God is now giving him this leadership role uh, of leading the people into the promised land. So that's the next step. I want to back up just a smidge here and reread a few verses in chapter 1. So I'm going to put that on the uh, screen. Joshua chapter 1, verses 2 through 5. This is the Lord speaking to Joshua as he looks out over the promised land across the river Jordan. He says, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I'm giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I promised to Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Now, I think it's real critically important that we uh, spend a little time here before we get into the rest of the text of Joshua, uh, investigating a little bit, going a little bit deeper. So there are some questions related to land that we need to start thinking about. You notice, perhaps you notice as I was reading that, God mentions land and he mentions giving this land to Joshua and the people of Israel, all the land of the Hittites, shall be your territory. So we have some land-related questions that pop up right away from the first chapter and that are important throughout the rest of this book. Number one, where do the Hittites go? They're living here. They're probably quite comfortable and happy with their land and their towns and their livestock and their way of life. And he, God, is saying to Joshua, it's no longer going to be theirs. I'm taking it from them and giving it to you. So what happens? Not just to the Hittites, but the Amorites, the Jebusites, all these ites, right, uh, that happen in the book of Joshua. Where do they go? I think that's a pretty pertinent question for us this morning. And why is the possession of this land so significant to Israel? Right at the start of this book, uh, this is... Well, we're going to look at it a little bit here, the, how this is the fulfillment of the promise of God to these people. But why is that so important? Why does that connect so deeply with these people, with their minds and their hearts and their really their identity? Land and the possession of living in this land is wrapped up into who we are 
as a people. So that's significant. Is this, and this is where we're getting into the, the nitty gritty, is this the right or is it the moral thing for God to do, to give to Joshua and then again, is it right or moral for Joshua to do this? This is a huge question. Maybe you haven't asked it yet, but there's a whole lot of people now more than ever when they read especially the book of Joshua and other passages in the, real, in the original testament where a big old question mark comes up. It doesn't seem right for God to displace all these people, to tell Joshua and the people of Israel to go in and conquer these people, to basically, it seems like the text says, to wipe them out off the face of the earth and then just give the land to somebody else. Does that seem like the right thing to do? Does that seem like something God should do? Especially when we talk about how God is holy and God is loving and God is righteous. Do those things interconnect? Is this the same God we're talking about? And one more question. What does any of this have to do with me? So hopefully we'll get there this morning. Because this isn't just a Bible study about ancient people that are dead and gone and who cares. It's not that. And I hope you're not thinking that. But just in case that's starting to enter in your mind, why is he droning on? This has value to us today, really for people of all time. So why should I care? Here's this beautiful picture of Israel. I don't know where it was taken from. I've never been there. Anybody here traveled to Israel? One? I saw one hand. Jeff, you're on the spot right now. Tell us everything you experienced in, in Israel. Okay. I don't know, maybe you've got pictures. Do you have pictures of your trip? All right, I should see them sometime. I've never been. I've always thought that'd be awesome to go. Uh, it, it, but it's hard, at least in one way, it's hard to visualize, right? You've never been there. And especially going into a, an ancient book of the Bible, what did they see? What is it they experienced? So this is a beautiful picture. I know there's some arid areas. There's desert-like regions. Um, the Bible talks about these desert-like places as wilderness, Okay? So I don't know if that connects you. What does wilderness look like? So in Israel, wilderness is empty, dry, nothing. Okay? But there are also beautiful places like in this picture that are green, that are lush, where vegetation grows uh, and uh, the production of fruits and nuts and, and agriculture, all those things flourish. Okay? So it is a beautiful place. So why should I care? So let's start with that one this morning. We'll start there with some different views regarding the land and possession of it and where that fits. Now, some believe okay, that from the time of Joshua, present-day Israel plus, so if you, I didn't put a map on here, but if you could kind of visualize a, a geographic political outline of Israel, that plus additional land, what we just read about Joshua 1, it'd be a much larger area that God is giving to the people of Israel than what present day political boundaries of Israel is. Okay, so there's there are a lot of believe, people that believe that that Joshua era uh, region should be Israel's alone today, and we should stand up with them for Israel to reclaim all of that land. As one evangelical leader put it, Joshua removed the Canaanites as an act of obedience and faith. We read about that in the book of Joshua. The same thing needs to happen today. Maybe you're on that end of the spectrum. Uh, maybe you feel like that or believe that. So this particular individual believes the same pattern of conquest and expulsion that happened to Joshua should be used today so that the conflicts that are happening today in Israel, and next to Israel, the nations border Israel. So all of that would end. If one wins, the conflicts end. And this leader believes the one that wins should be Israel because God gave it to them all the way back to the book of Joshua. So that's one belief. On the opposite extreme, we find those who believe that since other people groups were living in present day Israel, that region first, like the Hittites, for example, we just read about them, then their descendants have the right to the land and not Israel. Now, most notably, in all those different people groups, the Palestinians who claim to be direct descendants of the ancient Philistines. 
Now, we're not reading about Philistines all that much in the book of Joshua, but they're one of those people groups that lived and uh, habit, uh, habitated that land uh, near that strip of land near the Mediterranean Sea. So, uh, some people believe that since they were there first, they should keep it. And if you believe that, then what God does in the Bible, and even fast forward all throughout the rest of the history, over 2,000 years, then any act against them is some kind of a conquest, imperial, bloodthirsty kind of way to make might right, right? And well, because we're more powerful, we'll, we'll kick you out. And how could a God of love and forgiveness and peace and righteousness and holiness that we read about in other parts of Scripture, how could that be the same God that would send these people in to do that, okay? Now, Still others say that what we read about in Joshua is that plus, that it has some kind of ethnic cleansing dimension to it, a power grab uh, by the half of God and Israel as they are commanded by God. So that view really does make God out to be acting in a bloodthirsty way, and that should not be equated with a God of love. And that, for some people, kind of dismantles all of Scripture, so I'm not saying that's, I'm hopefully not, you know, adding confusion to you, but that's where a lot of people are at right now. I'm just telling you that this is a major stumbling block to a potential relationship with Christ. How could Christ represent a loving God in Scripture, and yet God does this to other people? You with me so far? So it's not just ancient stuff, it is present day stuff, and it's not just Middle Eastern politics. Because that affects, well, our politics, and in a bigger sense, it affects how it is that we understand God and his word. Either there's a disconnect, original testament, if you call it Old Testament, whatever, and New Testament. God has a different approach then, and he becomes a different God in the New Testament or whatever. Uh, I struggled with that when I was younger, because what I understood and what I read, it just it didn't. It seemed like there was a disconnect between these two uh, testaments or covenants of Scripture. So I, I had a hard time with that when I was younger. Maybe that's where you're at as well, or maybe you're just confused by the whole thing. I don't get it. I don't get what God's doing. I don't get what the point of it is today. So that's all right, too. Hopefully we're going to make sense of it, because none of those approaches that I just described really take Scripture at least seriously enough <laughs> And they fail to understand the bigger story, the big story of what God is doing that connects original Testament and New Testament. So we're big on that here at City on a Hill. We don't see a disconnect. God is God. God is one. God does not change. So what is he doing and how do we understand that? So to, do, to get us into that frame of mind here this morning, I'm going to show you a picture. There it is. It's on the screen. Now, and you're free to offer your ideas this morning. What, what do you see there? Describe in detail what you see on the screen for me now. Someone, please. Someone take a chance at it. What is it that you see? A square. Excellent. A big, a big, a big blurry pixel, potentially, right? Okay. Any other guesses? Chocolate ice cream. You might as well, right? So you could pick just about anything out of the, the clear blue sky, which we have a clear blue sky this morning. You could pick just about anything because why? You don't have enough information. All you can really do is guess, right? Because that's exactly what it looks like, a big square pixel. Well, how about this image? It's a bigger square. It's a, who said it? Somebody said it. It's a pig, right? It's the face of a pig. But what else can you tell me about the image? It's unclean, okay? Wrong kind of hoof. What's that? He's cute, of course. I grew up with little piglets. I could, I could hold them. I could scratch them. I tried not to think about their destiny, okay? But they're, they're fun, right? You don't, you don't think about it too much, okay? It, right. So the longer you look at it, what happens? 
You think of bacon. <laughs> you think of brunch later on. The longer, even though it's small, it's big enough, the longer you look at it, the more you see, right? So it's that plus this, okay? But you're still limited, right? You don't know what else is going on. So third image. Now, hey, Valentine's is coming up, right? I got to make connection <laughs> somehow. Now what's going on? There's all sorts of things that could, now, you know what? Nobody said anything at first, or two or three people. Now I hear all sorts of voices, because why? You get the bigger picture. Now, uh, let me just fill you in. This is actually Mitch at work. <laughs> Maybe you're wondering, what does Mitch do when he disappears for days or weeks on end, okay? All right, so there he is. And what else happens the longer you look at this image? There's what? It might be a chipmunk. Uh, I think it's a tiger. It's some weird tiger costume. Because you see that blurry blotch, whatever, above the pig nose? I think it says tiger, but it's not really perfectly clear, right? So yeah, why is this large tiger costume person in the back of the picture? We have no idea. Okay, why am I doing all of this? If you look at one verse out of the Bible, you get a pixel. Now, it's still God's truth, but it is really limited. Our perspective, the bigger picture, the larger context of what going, what's going on in God's truth is just not there. This is like what we just read this morning, Joshua 1, 2 through 5. I gave you a pixel of what it is that God is doing with Joshua and Israel in the land of promise. And that's all we've got. And now I've raised a bunch of questions that maybe weren't in your mind, but now are there. So we back up a little bit. You see a bit more. You have a little more context. Maybe if you're so inclined, wow, those questions that, that Bruce raised this morning, they seem important to me. Or maybe I've had that question. Maybe you'll go home after service and take the book of Joshua, take your Bible journal, which I'm um, you know, begging you to take so I don't have a bunch of them. So you take it home and you read through the whole book. You see a whole lot more than just that one chapter, don't you? So you're starting to get a bigger picture, but there's all the more questions that still linger, right? Why the pig head? What in the world's going on? Why Joshua? Why Israel? And the conquest and these things that he says to Israel and, and so forth, right? So if, and I'm a big proponent of what we call biblical theology. So what if we take the time to not just read Joshua, but we start sewing things together, the bigger themes that are throughout Scripture, then we begin to see the bigger picture of the story. So what is the bigger picture this morning? This is it. Not just about conquest or about the Hittites or even not just about the land, even though the land is so prominent in this book. God, here's a bigger picture. You see it on the screen. The, uh, God sets aside a place to be with his people so that they could be in his presence and have a relationship with him. This relationship is established in peace and provides rest. In other words, to be in the presence of God is to be at rest with him. Now, you may be saying, well, how in the world do you get that? That must be smart pastor talk. Okay, well, well maybe it's part of that. I don't know, but it's a whole lot more than that because we get that when we see Joshua in perspective in relationship to context. And context is always what? Oh, that was so miserable. Context is what? Thank you. It's king. It drives our understanding. It's got to. So we can't just look at a pixel. We've got to look at the bigger picture of Scripture and what does it tell us. So to be in the presence of God is to be at rest with him. In just a few minutes here, just for a few minutes, we are going to try to grasp the bigger picture because it's absolutely necessary so you don't go away wondering well, what about the Hittites well this doesn't seem right in what God is doing 
is part of a bigger, bigger picture. Now, I'm not going to answer all the zoom in questions. We are going to entertain those as we go along, okay? Especially the first half of the book of Joshua, as, Israel, as the Israelites enter into the land and we come to the battle of Jericho and all the detail that we have there and with other cities. So we'll zoom in a little bit uh, and be a little more careful with the details. So this morning isn't the details of all the conquests. This morning is the bigger picture. So we start with something that sounds very dry and almost academic, right? This is borderline academic. Theology of land and rest timeline. So I'm going to put what's going on. I know, right? Oh, he sounds so boring. Stick with me. It's not boring. This is actually a lot of fun to understand what's going on. I think it helps when we put things on a timeline. It helps me. Does it help you? You kind of see how the pieces begin to fit together uh, as they move along in a rational, coherent way. So that's what we're going to do this morning. So where do we begin? We begin here. God's plan, original plan, was for his entire creation to be at rest. One of the things I really appreciate about the book of Genesis, chapters 1 and 2, the whole creation account, the different days. I'm not going to read all of it. We'll read just a little bit. But the creation account, the different days, and God created. And then we come to the end of the creation week. And what does God do? He rests. Very beginning of Genesis chapter 2. Now, it's not because he's tired out. Oh, that was a lot of effort, right? I need to sit down and relax. It's not about that. So what is it about is crucial. So if the only thing you've ever done when you read Genesis 1 and 2 is argue about how long the days are, you've missed the point. You've missed the point entirely. Maybe not entirely, but the bigger context of what is going on in the book. It's interesting to talk about, right? But really all we can do from the language, the original text is speculate as far as is the day 24 hours or not. There is a bigger point to what is going on in that passage. So what is the point? Now, Genesis chapter 2, verse 1, thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. And he what? He rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. What does the author keep repeating? Rest. There was work and now it's rest. So you don't get any, I don't get any feeling from chapter one that this work was, was bothersome or a burden for God. He just spoke it into being. The creative wonder of the miraculous, we can't comprehend, right? He speaks. That's the power of the living Word of God. He speaks, bam, stuff comes into existence. I don't, I don't know how long it took, but it did. It comes into existence. So to really grasp the importance is the turning point of chapter 2, beginning of chapter 2. He rested from his work. He establishes this perfect, beautiful Sabbath day so not only God rests, but everyone else should rest. And even the law stipulates how creation that Israel is in charge of should also rest on the Sabbath. Why is that significant? Rest is not just, oh, I get to sit back you know, and, and not work at this point. Rest in creation, in Genesis, is a sign that what God set out to do is complete. And not only is it complete, it is holy in that Sabbath sense. And not only is it complete and holy, it ushers in a new era of worship. And that's what we see in chapter 2. Before sin comes in, of course, we see this new era for Adam and Eve and all of creation to worship the Creator. Uh, there are rules involved in the garden, uh, those boundaries are a part of worshiping God in appropriate ways. And as that worship goes out, then what it is that God has given them in the garden just continues to expand to, to fill the entire earth. I believe that's the point of chapter 2 and what God is stressing for all of us. To be at rest with Him. Now, there's a problem, isn't there? How long were Adam and Eve and all of creation at rest? Well, we don't know exactly because that's another time element that Genesis doesn't uh, you know, specifically directly give us. But 
as we discover, sin comes into the story. Adam and Eve are uh, thrown out of the garden. They are no longer at rest with God. Because of their sin and their rebellion, they cannot be at peace with God in His presence. Sin and rebellion, doing it your own way, always, always, always has consequences. It did for Adam and Eve, not just for them, for all of creation. So they are gone. But God, in His wisdom, in His mercy, and His love, seeks to find a way to bring people back into His presence, back into a good and right relationship where people can again be at rest. And that's what we see happening uh, throughout Genesis with Abram, as Abram is called to sojourn and travel. Abram turns into Abraham, all of his family with him. And then Genesis chapter 17, we see this covenant that God establishes with his people, and that covenant mentions an everlasting possession that God will give to his people with the stipulation that they obey the terms of the covenant. And then in Genesis 17, what happens after God speaks that to Abraham? The whole part of circumcision that is entered into, that is established as a covenant guideline for the people. You've got to be, all you, all you, all your family, all your generations from now forevermore, circumcision is the sign of the covenant. God says, I give you as a blessing this land for an everlasting possession is not every translation, by the way. We'll get to that in a second. But everlasting possession is a lot of translations. But you must be circumcised. You must obey the covenant to be set apart, holy to God, so you can again find your way back into his presence to be at rest and to worship him. Fast forward to what we're looking at in Joshua. God is sending Joshua after all the sojourning, after all the time in Egypt, after all the time Moses has been leading the people back from Egypt and the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness that brings us up to this pivotal next chapter moment with the life of Israel. Now, they're being sent into the land, but as we'll read, here's a spoiler alert, in case you don't know the book of Joshua, to take the land, do they really accomplish that? Well, partly, they partly obey what God has given them to take, but they don't completely take the land. So along with that, Israel, and we're going to look at this in just a few weeks, is given this moment through Joshua to renew the covenant, okay, that was already given to them, but those people have died and gone away, except for Joshua and Caleb, but they have this This moment, Israel does as a nation, to renew their relationship with God, but they don't keep the covenant. And it's kind of like a no-brainer. It's not a spoiler at all because Moses told them, you're not going to keep it. And even Joshua tells them they're not going to keep it. And all these stipulations of the covenant should have been a reminder to keep coming back to the Lord because not only are there blessings in the covenant, but there are curses in the covenant. Leviticus chapter 20, verses 22 through 26, expound on that, but let me focus in on this. God tells his people, through Moses, you shall keep all my statutes and ordinances and observe them so that the land you settle in may not vomit you out. Great language, right? It doesn't get any more clear than that, does it not? What happened with Israel as they disobeyed the covenant? The land puked them out. They went into exile, right? The Assyrians, the Babylonians, uh, some of the uh, the tribes are scattered forever. Uh, They don't come back in as a tribe. But after the exile, they are allowed to come back into the land. But then what happens? They're virtual exiles. Because after that time, then comes the Greeks, and then comes the Romans. So some people are scattered the diaspora, diaspora, excuse me. They're scattered all over the world. Some come back in, but they're not even people in their own land because of the iron rule of the Romans. All that is going on. So whatever happened to that everlasting possession? That's real important. It's important for this whole discussion. So briefly, let me, let me say this. The ESV does a, a, better, a better job at translating uh, Genesis 17. 
Because it does, maybe you've got NIV or whatever, maybe your translation says everlasting possession. It really ought to be everlasting covenant. Because the term, uh, the ancient Hebrew term there, has more to do with describing something that is open-ended, that is subject to conditions. Okay? So I say that because I need to say this. So here's the big moment, underline, okay? Nowhere in the Bible does God say you get to keep the land while you ignore the obligations of the covenant. Is that sinking in? One more time. Nowhere does God say you get to keep the land, all the blessings, right, of the covenant, while you ignore the obligations of the covenant. There are blessings and curses with every covenant. And obviously curses come because God did exile his own chosen people, okay? So that is a reality that cannot be ignored. It cannot in this whole discussion of what's going on. So that's Joshua. Let's fast forward from Joshua through all the kingdom and all the prophets to what God does with and through his son Jesus Christ to give us peace and rest that is independent of the land. So now, from the Gospels through the New Testament, it don't matter where you live, because it's not connected anymore to any part of that original covenant. It's not linked. The blessing of being a part of God's kingdom, of being invited back into his presence to find rest, is true and it is real for every person, every tongue, every culture, every ethnicity, doesn't matter where you live. So just remember this, when God finished with his creation, we looked at that Genesis 2, right? He, he says it's finished, and now it's time for Sabbath and rest and worship. Remember this, when Jesus on the cross cried out, it is finished, we receive the opportunity to rest in him. At first it's God resting and now, through Jesus Christ, we can finally rest in all the sojourning, in all of the wandering, in all of the story of Scripture that is so familiar, it ought to be so familiar, as we read it and we ponder it, familiar to us, to all of us. Why? Because we get rest from all of our struggles, rest from everything we've, we've strived to do to make a better life and find a greater purpose in this life. We find rest from all our past problems that seem to always come back and try to control us. We find rest even from future worries that keep stopping us, confusing us, frustrating us. In Christ and only in Christ, we can have rest. And that's what Scripture teaches us. And that's what Jesus himself calls out to us. The Ma uh, Matthew, the gospel writer, chapter 11, verse 28 Come to me, he says, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It's not what these Pharisees talk about. It's not found in the law. It's not in any law or way of life that you try to create to make it somehow better than it was yesterday. Only through Jesus can we find the rest that God intended in the first place. That's the wonder and the beauty and the power of Jesus come to rescue us. Now, we have a choice. One more bubble on the timeline. You have a choice whether or not you will enter his rest. We see that choice moment throughout the original testament over and over again. Joshua, it's a powerful moment at the end of a book, at the end of his book, where he says, anybody know? Choose now. Choose. You've seen God at work, but you've got to keep choosing. You can't rest on the past. There's always something new coming that God is doing. Keep choosing God and not yourself and not any other God from Egypt, not any other God that you create. We have this moment that we can choose rest and peace in the name of of Jesus Christ. Now the writer, here's where we're going to end this morning. The writer of the book of Hebrews, the New Testament, 
We don't know who he is. Some people say Apostle Paul, but uh, he didn't own authorship. It's really too bad. That would have been nice to know who wrote this great book. But the writer of the book of Hebrews pulls all these beautiful uh, stories and all this imagery from the original Testament that Jews that knew the law, knew the Torah, would be familiar with. And the writer pulls these things all throughout his book back into the story of the new covenant, the, new, the people that are redeemed through Jesus Christ. And here's what he says about Joshua and rest from Hebrews chapter 4. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Do you see that? That's the beauty of what's going on in Joshua. The writer of Hebrews saying, God is giving you rest. You can enter it. They, they never got it. It was incomplete. Everything without Jesus may look good for a while even, but it falls short. It's incomplete of the perfect peace and rest that is offered only through Jesus Christ. He says, enter in. Don't waste another moment. And what else does he say? Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort, same sort of disobedience all the way back to Joshua. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. I don't think it is just, it's by mistake. I don't think it just, it's happen chance or whatever. That Joshua in that first chapter, remember that? Let me, let me draw your attention to it. I think I've got it bookmarked here. Joshua chapter one, after, after God speaks to Joshua, you're gonna go into this land, be strong and courageous. And what is it that the Lord stresses to, uh, to Joshua, starting at chapter 1, verse 7, be careful uh, to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you'll be careful to do all to according to all that is written in it. For then, for then, and really only then, will uh, your way be prosperous and you'll have success. Remember when we talked about the first week? There is this idea of meditating. Uh, it's not some Eastern idea or mysticism kind of thing. It's sinking deep into God's Word. Not just memorizing it, although that may be the start. The point is to go deep. Why? So that the rest of your questions can begin to have light on them. You find the direction on your path. You begin to understand all it is that God has for you. So then you'll find success. Then your way is prosperous. Then you know what to do. So we like to jump ahead to the end point. God, just give me the answers. Why, God, don't you just give me all the answers and make this easy, right? He didn't do it for people in the Bible. He's not going to do it for you either. Why? Because he likes frustrating you? No. The point is to Dig deep into his word so you'll be shaped and changed by it. He is after your heart. Everyone, always. That's never changed. It's never been anything different. God wants your heart, all of it, to be transformed by his work. So then, as a part of his work, he sends you out. That's a part of the kingdom work of the gospel. You can't jump ahead on that one either. Oh, God, just give me the answers, and I'll be your hero for the faith off somewhere, wherever. No, you can't jump to the end. You've got to work through it, meditating on his word, letting it sink deeper into your heart. It is not any mistake that the writer of Hebrews goes from entering into that rest into stressing what? The power of God's word. It must have, it had to have been on his mind as he writes his letter thinking back to what God told Joshua. What does he do here? He reminds us the Word of God is living and active. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. It penetrates. It pierces. Why? 
into the heart. So the discerning and the thoughts and the intentions of the heart is laid bare. And don't read that and think before God. God knows your heart. He doesn't need a sword. He doesn't need anything else. He knows. Do we understand our heart? Never entirely. It's wicked. Who can understand it? Scripture says, right? But he's after it, and he's shaping it, and he wants to mold it. And just like he said to Joshua, as we remain in his word and all the frustrations of our wayward and complicated hearts, he wants to pierce down into it to, to remove, to change, to form, to reveal, so you begin to understand a little bit more who it is you are, how you're wired, and what your problems are, so that you can then in turn give him more of it. Wow! We can't be at rest, to truly enter with rest in God, in His presence, without also, and even first, entering into His Word. So I leave you with that this morning. If you've seen or understood God's Word as a devotional thought, where you can ponder for a moment and leave. If it's just something that you look at on Sunday morning because the pastor keeps you know, droning on and on, and then you leave it the rest of the week. If you think that God owes you something better because you said a sinner's prayer, or I am a decent religious person, right? Push all of that stuff into the garbage. Come back to his living word and allow it to change you. There's no substitute. There's no bypass. You can't, you can't skip this step. Now, all that happens with Joshua and his people is this painful reminder of how so many people and the Israelites skip that step. We've got to learn from somebody else's experience. Enter in to what God has provided through Jesus and what he reveals to you about yourself in his living word and find what it is you've been searching for. Let's pray. Oh, Jesus, we love your word. And we sense this morning its power, how it continues to sink into our hearts and reveal and frustrate and cause concern because we haven't been given fully over to you. Lord Jesus, cause us from the depth of our heart to long for what it is that only you, you alone can give. Rest for our weary souls. We are grateful that you beckon to us even now, come to you so that we can find that rest. Lord Jesus, make this a different week because we're seeking you and we're finding out more from your word and we're allowing you to work on our hearts and minds so that what we understand now will be nothing compared to what we understand and what we know of you next week. Do that, we pray as we long for more of you. In Jesus' name, amen.